So we discussed the Acropolis and we stopped by the theater at the base of the Acropolis before you go up to the top during the Panathenaic procession. The next thing that we're going to discuss is actually the um, the buildings that you encounter as you travel around in the Panathenaic procession. So as you do the Panathenaic procession, you, you pass around the base near the Theater of Dionysus and the Herodian Theater. You go all the way around as my cursor is going, and then you end up at this Propylaea. And when you get, you walk up these sort of steps, and there's also a ramp on the side there that would allow for uh, wheeled carts and stuff like that to go up there. The Propylaea is the gate, and that's located right here. So this Propylaea on the right-hand side is a little temple called the Temple of the Nike or Nike Temple. The Nike Temple and the Propylaea are made by two slightly separate or different um, architects, and the construction on them wasn't really completed until a little bit after the beginning, probably during the, the uh, Peloponnesian Wars with Sparta. But Nesicles made the Propylaea, which is this sort of gateway structure that leads in and has an art gallery in it. And then Callicrates made the Nike temple, which is on the right-hand side there, and kind of located almost like a lookout. And it's a temple to the goddess Nike, who is the goddess of victory. It's sort of looks out over Athens, and in a way, you can almost think of victory symbolically looking over Athens. <clears throat> In the center, it would have been a statue of Athena Nike, and the temple is actually a small, a relatively small structure that probably played, you know, relatively a small role in the life on the Acropolis and on the Panathenaic procession. But it's kind of like when you get up to the top of this Acropolis, which is the high city, victory greets you there. It's a typical Amphoro style temple, which means that it has a cella in the front and then a small portico in the back. And it's almost like a garage that would hold a cult statue. And so we're going to take a look at this temple and what it means and what it symbolizes by looking closer at the entablature and looking at some of the details. When you zoom in on the Nikkei Temple, one of the first things you'll notice is that the columns are a specific order. It looks like the capital letter I. It has sort of curly cues in its hair. That's the Ionic style. And it has a simple continuous running freeze. Now, one of the uh, sort of problems with the Ionic style is that it's kind of like some cars that are not very good. It doesn't take corners very well. So if you look at how it has to deal with the volutes going back when you're looking at the front of the temple, as opposed to the corners of the temple, it almost has this sort of like wheel-like design coming off the side. And that's just an interesting little detail. In the entablature of it, there's a continuous running freeze without the benefit of the alternation of uh, these sort of framing devices that we call triglyphs and metopes that we'll look at on the Parthenon. There's a very famous statue on the parapet of the Nikkei Temple, and the parapet is just a low-lying wall, and of course it's no longer in C2, which means that that statue is no longer in its original situation. And it's a statue of a Nikkei who is actually adjusting her sandal. So in a way, there's been a lot of uh, offers of, of what this might stand for, and what the parapet, and what the, the frieze on the Nikkei Temple might have held, but nobody's really even 80% sure enough to offer a very, very strong theory on it. So let's just say it probably represented a sort of procession that depicted Nikkei figures. And we can see here this Nikkei figure has wings coming off the back. She's lost her head and, and some of the features, but you can actually see the remains of wings coming off of her back. And um, my professor, Herbert Broderick, suggested it's just a, a sort of procession and she's stopping and adjusting her sandal as just before she goes on the rest of her procession. For me and for understanding Greek art and I, I hate to say it this way, but there's an inherent misogyny or disrespect for the female form in a strange way. You'll say, well, there's lots of figures of nudes uh, uh, or, or figures of females. There are no nudes up at this point. And what they do is it's kind of like the cheesy way that people get around um, not being allowed to go topless in some bars. Uh, and um, 
honestly, I've never been to a place like this, but I've seen them in movies. Uh, you know, like the wet t-shirt contests at places like Hooters or other bars and, and clubs like that, where, oh, you're not allowed to have the female unclothed, so you need to cut, um, show her body off in some way. And in this instance, this is kind of like that. This style of drapery is called the wet drapery style, which represents the male's desire to see the female form, but then the sort of edicts against it or, or the, the warnings against it. Let's see how this theory of mine sort of fleshes out, at least up until 450 BCE. So on the far left-hand side, we have this figure called the Karyatid figure, which is one of the clothed wet drapery figures that are from the actual Acropolis on the temple of the called the Erechtheon. Then we see the Doryphorus and uh, we see the athlete of Critios or a Phoebe of Critios or Critian boy. And then we see a, uh, a Kore figure and an archaic Koros. And you'll see that they're the only nude figures up here in this sort of cross section of five uh, anthropoid sculptures and uh, is actually the um, male figure. And so there really is a strong uh, objection to showing the nude female form in Greek art. And I think it depicts in a way the role of women in their culture. So for instance, the Karyatid that we're going to study later, she literally holds up the culture and it's almost like she's holding a basket on her head, which a lot of people, this is how women might have carried loads of, of stuff. But she is actually a representation of someone who is sort of holding up society but as my as my grandmother used to say i'm just a piece of furniture i just hold the walls up you know that kind of thing well let's see if i can add a little bit more uh evidence to my theory what we're looking at are a couple of uh pieces from the so-called high classical or golden age and what we see are a couple of vessels that are lekythos which are basically made to pour out oil. And there is a theme that runs throughout a lot of Lekathoi, uh, which is the mistress and the maid theme. And the, the theme is basically a fairly wealthy woman who is uh, very attractive and wearing um, either a, a peplos or a cor uh, or a um, or some kind of chiton, usually is encountering a maid or some kind of woman who is bringing her a box. And we see in the uh, middle one that has the uh, lighter background that she's actually being seated down and, and she's being carried, she's bringing in a box. And if we compare that against the stele of Hegeso, which is actually literally, a, it's a gravestone from 410 BCE, we can see that the theme depicted on it is actually the same mistress and maid theme in which the um, miss the maid is bringing her a box and it looks like she's looking at her jewelry. This is actually an important work of art uh, also for the neoclassical period that happens in the 1700s of the of the common era because they this theme gets taken up by artists like Angelica Kaufman with a, a painting called um, Cornelia's Jewels and, and we'll look at that when we study later art history. The other thing I want you to notice about the Stele of Hegeso is that it's a relief sculpture. She has wet drapery style. There's no real creation of deep space in any of the art that we're looking at from the Golden Age in the, in the vases or in the um, relief sculpture that we're going to be looking at. And the other thing is the stylization of the nose uh, and the face and that profile is consistent with what I was talking about when we looked at the, uh, the part of the lecture where we studied how the proportions and head of, of figures is established. The uh, next segment, we're going to talk about what happens when you leave the Nikkei temple and look at the so-called propylea. Um, a propylon that we've studied in other cultures is actually a structure that is a kind of gateway. Um, this propylon or pro -pro propylon by Nesicles is actually a sort of museum. And we get our word museum, home of the muses. Uh, they you see the first part is muse and muse is something that amuses us or inspires us. So we're going to go in and take a look at it. If you look a little closer at the plan, there's actually, it's designed to be symmetrical, but it kind of has some 
wacky little places in it, especially off to the left. It looked like it was supposed to have had another room. And Jennifer Tobin, a uh, professor from the University of Illinois at Chicago, discusses this in one of her lectures in which she actually says uh, – something to the effect of it was during the, the Peloponnesian War and they didn't have a chance to finish it. Now, it looks like they actually had storage spaces and possibly there's a sort of bench-like structure inside the structure. And this uh, bench-like structure um, on either side of one of the rooms indicated to her that this might have even been used as a dining area and that there might have been paintings on the walls on either side of this structure uh, of this museum. We also know that there were sculptures that were found in there and that it was meant to be a sort of sculpture museum. So when my professor Herbert Broderick discussed this, what he kind of suggested was that it was almost like those vestibules that you have in banks or big buildings that as you're walking into a, um, let's say, uh, an entertainment complex, sometimes they have a courtyard with a fountain. And then as you walk in, the lobby has sometimes art and posters hanging in it. And, it, and you could refer to that lobby as a vestibule. And it's a sort of space that is a transitional area between the inside and the outside. And if you think about it, this sort of propylon, which is a gateway, uh, initially gate gateways were defensive structures. It also sort of gives you a defensive or at least a transition area between the sacred world and the um, everyday world, the secular world. And so when you stand inside this propylon, this gateway, these uh, series of columns on either side, and you look at the art and you collect yourself and rest yourself for a moment and you step out, what you see across the courtyard is actually a sculpture of a statue of Athena. And Athena is in a different mode this time. She's not Athena Nike. She's Athena Promachus. And pro means for and makos is war. And we see uh, Centauromachi Maki and um, Gigantomachi. Uh, those are terms that come up a lot, so that's why I thought I'd mention it to you. So we see Athena, who is the warrior goddess, standing in the courtyard facing you as you leave this sort of art gallery, art museum. And it's a way of preparing you for the sacred precinct in which you're going to enter next.